How did you get started in real estate, and when did you decide to leave your job as a waiter? It was easy to leave my job as a waitress because I was washing the counter one night, and my future boyfriend, an investor, walked in. I looked at him. I knew I'd be losing my virginity, but I, what was even better is he loaned me $1,000 to start. And that's why I quit the job as a waitress. I thought, why not? I had tried so many other jobs, I think 22, 21 in total, that I thought, I'll give this a shot. He thought I'd be good in sales, mm -hmm. and so I started a business. How did you ask him for the $1,000? How did that conversation go? I slept with him. Wow, that works. <laughs> you didn't expect that answer, <laughs> no. right? I eventually did, by the way. <laughs> but he gave me the $1,000 before, before that, actually. Uh, Technically, maybe okay. by a night or two. How did your childhood influence your mentality to be successful? Your childhood is everything. It's half of who you become. Uh, you have to realize that I had nine siblings competing for the attention of two parents. So I learned to be competitive. We all did. We were a competitive family. You had to be heard. Hmm. And uh, the other thing that was very important in my childhood is I was a terrible student. I couldn't read or write till I was almost in seventh grade. So I was labeled the dumb kid. Hmm. And as a dumb kid in that jailhouse other people call school, I just couldn't wait for that bell to ring, and my idea of hell on earth was being asked to read out loud. It taught me shame. Mm. And I honestly think my whole career has been one long attempt to prove to the world that I'm not stupid. That really is true. It was an asset, but I didn't know it then. Sure. How were you competitive, though, against your siblings? Easily. You have to be quick-witted. You have to speak up fast. You have to be clever. And you have to make them jealous so that they want to compete, and that raises the ante. Sure. Yeah, you but just how would you do? How would you make them jealous? In oh, what way? by getting my parents to laugh more, uh, by making fun of someone so everyone saw the floor in that particular sibling and laughed at them, and then we'd pass the ball around and make fun of each other. But it was about the best man wins. The best man wins with their mouth. So everybody, everyone did well with their words in my family. What drove you to becoming an entrepreneur? My dad. Uh, my dad wasn't an entrepreneur, should have been in hindsight, I realized. He got fired from his job probably every year of my childhood, and he would come to the kitchen table and sit down early, like 5 o'clock instead of 6. Dad's home, and he said, guess what, kids? And we'd all scream, you're fired, because <laughs> it was such a common occurrence. And then just like a real-life John Wayne figure, yeah. he'd tell us how he told the boss to take his job and shove it up where the sun don't shine, and we were like, yay, Dad! So in our family, we have 10 kids, and 8 and 10 are entrepreneurs. I'm sure that's my dad's influence. We all hate our bosses. Hmm. I've had great bosses, but I never really liked them because of my dad's influence. I thought it was terrible to have somebody telling you what to do. Yeah. Did he ever worry, though, about losing his job? All the time, but you know who worried most? Yeah. My mom. My dad was braggadoso, and thank God he interviewed well. He got a job fast. Yeah. Within two, three weeks, my recollection. Okay. Uh, but my mother sweated it out. She didn't know how she was going to feed her kids. She didn't know how she was going to clothe them. She worried her whole life. Uh, but it always worked out. She had that capacity to kind of brave it through yeah. and support my father in his in his job quitting, which I would have read him the Riots Act, yeah. Riots Act, if I had ten kids. You know. How tight was money back then? Uh, it was really tight. But it's a weird thing about money. You know, money is all about expectation, I think. And as a kid, uh, we were no poorer than the other kids in our town. We were all poor. And, uh, you know, we all got new pajamas for Christmas. Now, that might not sound like a big deal. But with all of us unwrapping our new pajamas every Christmas Eve, we felt like we were in Beverly Hills, like, put on our new pajamas, you know? Sure. Uh, but I think we were buffered from that. It wasn't like we didn't eat. We ate. You know, and even Bubsy would uh, feed us <laughs> from the grocery store on the com when my dad lost his job and would catch up with them later. Right. So it, it's funny. We, we had so little, but my memory was we had everything because I really had loving parents. And I think uh, that's what kids really are focused on and how rich you are. Yeah. Do you notice any correlation between someone's income and their desire to become an entrepreneur? Like maybe people who grew up in slightly more you know, poverty tend to do better as an entrepreneur or have more drive? Do you notice any correlation? Without a doubt. I love investing in poor kids because they're like me. I understand them, where they're coming from. Uh, what you have as an advantage if you're a poor kid is you have no monkey on your back. You don't have parents hoping you're going to measure up, go to the right schools, hmm. perform well. So that's out of the way. Okay. You have nowhere to go but up. So there's no downside. You have no money to lose. Think of the freedom of that. 
That's what poor kids have, and you know what else they have? Mm. They have ambition. If they have the ambition, they have a burning desire to have the fancy car, the nice house. They've never been on a luxury vacation, so they're driven. I like to get poor kids like that because I understand where they're coming from, and I know they're gonna push, push, push like crazy, and that's an advantage, without a doubt. What challenges did you face as a female entrepreneur? You know, I don't ever, th think I thought about that. What I faced as an entrepreneur was the old boys club and there were no women there. But I don't think it really registered so much with me. I never saw myself as a woman competing with men. I saw myself as a competitor. Sure. Just a competitor. That's it. But I'll tell you the great advantage of being a, a nobody, whether it be a woman or from a different part of society, the great advantage is nobody's really watching you, taking you seriously. And nobody really gives a damn. Hmm. And that and then again that's a great freedom you have. Yeah. Because you're you're the outlier and you're free to do whatever you want, you know? Yeah. When did you start cutting people with negative energy? What prompted that? Oh, one bitch that I hired. <laughs> God, she was terrible. I guess I was 25, I had already been in business four years, and I hired a superstar salesperson. I don't know how I got her from another firm, I didn't deserve her, and boy did she interview well until she came in house. She was a bitch to live with. And I thought to myself, you know what, I'm so positive I'm gonna turn this lady around. It took me a year to realize the great truth, which I never forgot, if her parents couldn't make her happy, why did I think I could make her happy? Forget it. Yeah. And. I never made her happy, but I never worked on making people happy or pleasant or positive-minded again, if they weren't by nature. Yeah. And so I always think of uh, negative people as being thieves. They're gonna steal my energy, my goodwill, and the goodwill of my great agents all around me, you know, good, good yeah. employees. And so I protect and I fire them. I'm great at firing, particularly on Fridays. Yeah. I can't wait to fire a complainer. Really? Yeah. What's the first if thing you If you complain sense? to me, I think I'm gonna be firing <laughs> you too. <laughs> what's, what's the first thing you notice though when someone starts complaining? And how do you tell it's coming from a negative place versus maybe something unfortunate or just like in a moment? Yeah, I could spot it a mile away. You have to picture a real estate sales operation. When I was small, when I was huge, you have endless desks in a sales pit with sales agents on it. All I would do is walk through the area and I could feel the vibes and I could see someone. Talk, blah, 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 blah. Nobody whispers unless they say negative stuff. Positive people are outward. Right. People who are inward are negative. So, mm, what are they saying? They're pulling somebody into their pity party, yeah. complaining, including other people. That's when I say, what are you doing on Friday? Would you have an hour for me? <laughs> Can't wait till they yeah. come into the office. So let's say someone is negative. Yeah. How would you recommend changing that? If they acknowledge themselves that maybe this is a bad trait that I have, or maybe it's not helping me, what would you say to that person if they want to make a difference? Well, honestly, I don't do that. Okay. I'm quick to fire. Um, you know, I tried to turn uh, that particular woman into a positive person and sp probably spent half my energy on her even though I had probably at the time another 80 salespeople. What a waste of time. And uh, I never succeeded. If somebody comes in with a bad attitude, you could teach people anything, but you can't change attitude. That's what I've learned. Got it. What were some of the biggest challenges that you faced in building your real estate career? Well, God. Building any business is all about challenges, obstacles. It's how well you could jump over them. Uh, I opened my business a year before the city went bankrupt. I lived through 18% interest rates. I lived through the stock market crash. What other went wrong? The debacle of the mortgage debacle. 9-11, mm -hmm. yeah. I lived through and then sold my business. I actually signed the contract the Friday night before 9-11. That was just pop wow. luck. Yeah. Um, but I lived through all of that. Uh, but you want to know something? That's not the real obstacle. For me, and maybe not with other people, for me the real obstacle was the negative tape in my head and it took me years to rip it out. You know, the negative tape that says, you shouldn't be here, you shouldn't have tried, they don't like you. The millions of excuses, you know. Well, you know, just all that negative tape, you're not gonna make it, you're not respected, you don't have the right education, you can't do this, you can't do that. I had so many can can cans in my head. And it probably took me until I was 35 to really get rid of it, and I can't even say I got rid of it yeah. totally, because if I'm insecure, I feel a little bit back, but now I have a great tape. Yeah. You are amazing, Barbara. You are fabulous, so I kick into that tape when got I need it. that for the energy. But what prompted that, though? How, how easy was it, or how difficult was it to get that negative tape out? I worked on it my whole life. Okay. My whole life, it's not easy. You know, it's so hard to leave behind your past. 
I mean, it's not, it doesn't happen. You leave it behind because of a rah-rah speech or, or you have one great experience. You go, I don't care that I had this go wrong as a kid. It stays with you. It stays with you. But I think at some early point, I recognize that as an advantage that that wasn't an, it was a negative tape, mm -hmm. but it was the thing that propelled me. I, I very often think, I think I spent my whole life trying to prove to the world that I'm not stupid. Imagine if I didn't have that experience. Yeah. I'd probably have some other negative tape, yeah. but it's very hard to get rid of it. It's about willpower, you know, just insisting and being kind to yourself, which isn't so easy mm. when, you, when you have something from childhood, I think. Yeah. Well, having lived through all of those experiences, what do you think of the real estate market now? Well, it's a choppy market yeah. right now. I mean, we had a, a, a super duper market as a result of COVID. Nobody saw it was coming, okay? Even I didn't see it coming. Like, wow, how did this happen? Well, prices went up by 20, 25% most places, crazy. Yeah. Uh, so now we're in the deflation area. It's shaking out, but I'm not worried about it long-term at all because it's on investor markets, on a hyped up market. It's not bought for the wrong reasons. Yeah. It's individuals who have a home. They're all worried that they paid too much but happy they got low interest rates yeah. and it's kind of a stuck market now. Uh, but I just feel like it's got to shake out with inflation and then it will take off again. Sure. Are you buying real estate right now? I always do. Really? I love it. In fact, uh, I invest in real estate through my son who buys in all different cities out the, uh, throughout the United States that yeah. are good cities. Okay. okay. And uh, I might tell you we've never gotten better deals because people are insecure. The best time yeah. to buy real estate, of course, is the worst time, but mm -hmm. who wants to do it because we're all scared. Yeah. Uh, but but uh, we're getting deals uh, back from uh, sellers who wouldn't even entertain our offer. They're calling us back really? now. So it's a great time, and yet rents are going up. So think yeah. of that, you pay less for the real estate and rents are going up. That's a perfect storm. Do you believe that rents though would go down for people who can't sell their home? They don't want to get rid of their mortgage at 3%, so they'll mm -hmm. rent their home. Don't you mm -hmm. think that excess inventory might suppress prices? No, it's just not enough. First of all, think of that circumstance. Someone's living in a home and wants to rent their home. Very mm -hmm. few people are comfortable with that. They typically sell or need the money to get something else. So no, not enough inventory. Yeah. There really is uh, the biggest bottleneck in the market right now is shortage of inventory. It sounds absurd, right. but not enough listings coming on market to choose from. Yeah. And then the second biggest problem is the higher interest rate. Mm -hmm. It's funny to me, I bought real estate when it was 18, 17%. I don't know what all the squawking's about, <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's not that high. So how do you approach negotiating a property today? Are you going in and trying to lowball it or make an aggressive offer and then wait? Or how, how do you do this? The latter. You make an aggressive offer, people are offended, and then you wait it out. Okay. If you do that with enough properties, say 30 properties, somebody bites, somebody calls you back in, you know you're going to get a good deal. Yeah. Can you share with us what areas that you personally like the most? Uh, my personal area, of course, is New York City. <laughs> sure. Uh, you know, my son doesn't happen to agree with that. He doesn't think it's a friendly town for landlords. I happen to love New York City. Um, most of my investments, my best investments, have really been in Pittsburgh, hmm. an area that's well-educated, a friendly government, rents are going through the roof. The average age, I think, that I'm moving in is something like 23. Yep. Okay, so it's a great city. Also, Baltimore we're buying in. Uh, Denver, Colorado, although that's a little steamed up in some of the places. He does that. I don't really do it. Got but it. I do New York. Cool. Yeah. How were you approached to do Shark Tank? Oh, that was a lucky break, another yeah. lucky break. Maybe as lucky as meeting my uh, future partner at the diner, right? Uh, Mark Burnett called me because I was doing morning gigs on the Today Show on real estate. I was their real estate and house expert. When the market was falling apart, trouble always makes good news, right? Yeah. And I got a call from him asking if I want, well, not him personally, he's an important guy, his assistant to the assistant to the assistant probably, asking me if I'd be interested in the show I thought I'd be interested. They sent me a contract. I never read it. I just signed it and mailed it back at Federal Express right away. Yeah, sure. You know, and then uh, the same woman called to say Mr. Burnett had changed his mind. He, has, he had hired another woman. I couldn't believe it. It was like, because I pictured it. I bought my new luggage at Bergdorf's. I had real nice outfits I bought. And I was going to Hollywood. I yeah. told all my friends, woo, go to Hollywood. Fur coat. I didn't buy a fur coat. I didn't buy the fur coat. I had my right. same old, old yeah. fur coat all these years. Not for, not for Hollywood. You right. didn't need it. Um, but when I got that call that he had changed his mind, the best thing I ever did was I did what I do well. I objected. And I wrote a note saying I appreciated him considering me as a fallback, which is what the girl said. How mm. insulting. But I do my best work when I'm in first position. And he should consider 
inviting both women out to compete for the seat. And I gave him my reasons why, why I always recovered from rejection. I said, I think your rejection is my lucky charm. And it's always been my lucky charm. And told him why he should hire me. And he invited us both out to compete for the seat. And I won it. Thank God I spoke up. Yeah. How did you compete? How did they do that? Oh, it, they put her on the set for a half a day, me on okay. the set for a half a day. I thought I was doing terribly. I felt really? for sure I lost the gig. But I guess I wasn't that bad, or yeah. maybe just a little bit better. Who well, knows? What did the challenge look like? Did they have mock uh, entrepreneurs come up, or did no, they have like, it was real, a real things? Deal. And they just okay. First day of shooting, they were yeah. real entrepreneurs. They just walked onto the set. We didn't know what we were doing. What I didn't know at the time, I was with Damon John, who had never done Shark Tank, nor I, but we had two sharks from Canada who yeah. had been doing Shark Tank for a couple of years, and that entrepreneur came out and they said. What are you return? Da, 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 da. We didn't even know what questions to ask. We were so shocked. Uh, Damon and I thought we'd be fired, but we weren't. We, we stayed as sharks. It was what amazing. Was, what was the pitch? Do you remember what you said? Yes, I remember the first pitch on Shark Tank. Was it the first? Yeah, I think it was the first, maybe the second, but my memorable one was two old people. <laughs> Actually, I should have bought it in hindsight. Yeah. I wasn't old enough to appreciate them then. Okay. <laughs> I am now. But two old people pitching a charcoal-lined underwear. Because if you have a gas issue, <laughs> they said the, <laughs> the charcoal, they said in their squeaky voices, I thought they might die on the same. They, they said in their squeaky voices, you have gas. <laughs> <laughs> The charcoal sucks up that gas and nobody smells it. And we laughed and laughed. Did Nobody gave them a bid. But did the product work? I mean, I they, they must have had They look credible. <laughs> what old granny and grandfather is going to lie about something like that? They were the credible spokesperson. Yeah. However, at the time, I think I had in my head there's going to be some great businesses coming out. I better <laughs> pass on this one. In hindsight, that was such a clever idea. It crosses yeah. my mind a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you make a product? Like this? Well, it's it's just so funny you're saying that because I actually Put them in was, diapers. Seriously, I think that would be Diapers are out there, believe me. I okay. don't have them, but I know a lot of people wear them. <laughs> no, but not for adults, but for children. Just imagine like a baby's diaper. Or something. Oh, you maybe mean it has a they... charcoal. So when you're out in oh. public, maybe at a restaurant and the baby goes to the bathroom, maybe it's just no, no mother is good. no mother is going to find that smell so bad or try to hide it. Forget it. It's intended okay. for old people. <laughs> See, I'm thinking the market's everybody. You know what? I really keep yeah. thinking about it. I should call my producer Clay and yeah. say, "Could you mean the name and number?" But I'm sure they're not alive. I'll be talking to their grandparents who maybe yeah. have the panties still. <laughs> That's funny. So, how do you balance then being nice? versus being brutally honest and, and maybe crushing someone's dreams. Oh, well, crushing people isn't my job. That Kev's, that's Kevin O'Leary's job. Yeah. He's a bastard on the set. And that's his job. He's the mean guy. You mm -hmm. know, the old line, take it out behind the barn and shoot, shoot it. it. Everybody yeah. knows it. Yeah. I think he's been f forbidden to use that line yeah. anymore. I love it. I wait for it. Uh, but his job is to decimate someone, mm -hmm. sadly, you know? Uh, but that's it. You know, you need a couple of different personalities. My job, I consider my job, is to encourage people. I don't want to be a Pollyanna and say, oh, you got a great idea. I tell the truth. I definitely tell them the truth, but I say it nicely. Because sure. I think the most important thing is to use, to leave that individual whole. Because, you know, if that's not a good idea, they could go out and start another business. Yeah. yeah, but it's just not fair to beat them, beat them up, yeah. I don't think. Have you ever met an entrepreneur or see uh, maybe a personality type and you could just tell this isn't for you, you shouldn't be an entrepreneur? Do you ever feel that? Or maybe this mm. isn't your calling, it's something else is waiting for you? All the time. That entrepreneur or couple or group of people walks on the set, I look at them and already I know if I'm out. Mm. <laughs> And it's interesting, why am I out? It's just an intuitive reaction to the individual. I either look at them and say, I don't trust them. I look at them and say, they're not gonna have the confidence to overcome obstacles because they can't hold eye contact when they're on set. Right from the get-go, they're yeah. looking here, they're, they're scared. I mean, uh, they're performing nervous, on a stage yeah. is, is reasonable. I get the guess that you would be scared, but my gosh, making a pitch, you can't hold eye contact, not a good sign. They're not dressed the part. They start to say, I'm in the shrimp business. The guy doesn't look like a cook or doesn't look like a guy who has an apron on who likes shrimp. It just doesn't fit. Yeah. Uh, and you know what? Intuition is a funny thing. I, I do trust it implicitly or yeah. explicitly, whatever the right word is, um, because um, I think it's the summation of everything you've learned to date. Sure. And you don't know how it all mixes up like a spaghetti pot and how it works. But in the end, you're thinking, I like it or I don't like it. And then I listen for an hour and a half as to why I don't really like it to justify it.
But I know when I'm out right away yeah. with an individual, yeah. When did you start trusting your intuition? I think when second grade. Really? I would know when to go to the bathroom to avoid being called on. I would know which kids would laugh at me. I know which desk I wanted to sit in. I knew how to run for cover. I knew how to save embarrassment. I knew how to use my humor to get kids to like me. I, I just understood that. I, I just understood how to use my personality to get through on things, you know? Yeah. You think your intuition has ever been wrong or maybe you've been overly cautious because you've, you've listened to yourself too much? My intuition has been wrong when I love the person because I'm blinded, you know? I, if you're in a situation where you want someone to feel affection about you or uh, feel like you're in their court, that's very often when I'll make a mistake. Hmm. Uh, usually with someone I know, particularly with I've lost two friends by helping them out financially, and my intuition was blind. You can't have a friendship if you're gonna be superior to someone, lend them money, or they're working for you. You can't be a friend anymore. Yeah. It's about equality. So, so I've been wrong a couple of times, and it's usually been uh, when I mix up personal relationships with business. I've learned to keep it separate, or I like to think I do. I'll let you know when I make the next mistake. Sure. Yeah. All right. What red flags do you notice in entrepreneurs? Same red flags I'm always looking for. You know, when somebody's on Shark Tank night, uh, the world opens up to them. They become a mini celebrity overnight. Mm -hmm. Their orders come in. Even if their business is never gonna do well, it does well at first because of Shark Tank night. They sell oodles of their product. I don't pay attention to anything till about three, four months later when I get the call. The call is, oh my God, my patent didn't come through. Oh my God, my, my, my product is at fault. Or oh my God, my product never came in. Or, Things are wrong. And here's the difference. A bad person, well not a bad person, but a, a bad entrepreneur, would-be entrepreneur, blames it on somebody else. That's all I'm listening for. The minute they start playing victim, like, oh, he promised me, blah, 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 versus saying it's my yeah. business, I'll take the hit, let me tell you what I'm gonna do about it. I would say that four out of five people in month three or four, I hear that pity party and I don't spend any more time with them. I'm never gonna get my money back out because people who spend time feeling sorry for themselves versus just reacting, getting it back up and doing it, never make it. I've learned that. I've been on Shark Tank 14 yeah. years. Victims don't make it, period. Yeah. yeah. How do you decide whether or not to pursue an idea? An idea you mean on Shark Tank? Or a concept, yeah. or maybe something that you think might make a good business. I wouldn't uh, actually give any time to thinking of things that would make a good business because I have it on a plate at Shark Tank. Sure. Um, but in answer to your question, what was your question? I could do How do you decide to... whether or not to pursue something? And that might have been oh. even, how, how did you decide to, to pursue Shark Tank? What mm. did that offer you outside of what you were already doing? Well, Shark Tank, uh, gave me the opportunity to get more exposure over the Today Show, if it were a successful show, yeah. and it became successful over the first three years. Um, but Shark Tank also gave me uh, the opportunity to pick and choose what businesses I wanted to be in, and doing something I do very well, which is choosing people. That's the way I really see Shark Tank. Mm -hmm. I sit there choosing people. I don't really give a damn what the business is. If it makes common sense, and you know, if it doesn't make common sense, and I have a good entrepreneur, they'll change it. Yeah. You know, we'll change it together, so it always works out. Uh, but no, I'm sitting there judging people. If I'm picking the right people, I do well. When I don't choose the right people, I do poorly. If you were to start over today with zero, what would you do? Oh, like I had no money, no yeah, job? No money. Well, yeah, I'd get my old job at the Fort Lee Diner back. I think it's a Chinese restaurant. Maybe I okay. wouldn't quite fit there, but I'd get some kind of job like that, save up my money, and start something else new. Yeah, if I if I had the energy. Yeah. You're talking about right now, I'd have the energy. But if you're going to ask me 10 years, who knows? Sure. Yeah. How is your business currently broken down? Um, well, I have pieces. Uh, my major business is real estate investment. Mm -hmm. Okay, I love real estate. I know it. I know it well. And you can make a lot of money in real estate. My major income is from remortgaging my properties. I take a ton of cash out. Every two or three years, I can put a different mortgage on that, right. boom, and take that cash out tax-free and it's legal. Yeah. Uh, so that I consider my mainstream of income. Then my hits on Shark Tank. 
pay well when they hit mm -hmm. and cost a lot of money when they don't. Yeah. <laughs> but in the end, I make good money, uh, not like I would in real estate over the long term. Yeah. And then what's my, my revenue? I'm a working girl. Yeah. I mean, I give speeches, I, I do endorsements, I do whatever you do uh, to make money on your brand. Yeah. And that's what I do. That's the third source of income. For the startups, how many mm -hmm. Fail versus how many succeed? The and truth. You have a home run. The truth. I'm gonna have. Yeah. You seem like a doctor. Yeah, I'm gonna yeah. tell you the truth. Okay, tell me I the truth. I would say 80 percent of my businesses fail. Okay. Now, if you ask the other sharks, they'll tell you two thirds of them are winners. However, I listen to the sharks and say, "Hey, how are you doing on such and such? Oh, it's a winner, runaway trade, Barbara. You can't believe it." And then I talk to their assistant yeah. and say. How's Mark doing on that business? They, <laughs> and the, his assistant says, oh, God, we lost it right away. Thanks very much. <laughs> oh, so gosh. don't believe what you hear, but I'm telling the yeah. truth when I say 20%, maybe even 15% if I really did the numbers, honestly. And if it's, let's say, 15 20%, what makes that difference? Is it more so the person, or is it having a good concept? Actually, both. Okay. I only paid attention to the person. Uh, but they happen to have a good concept too. Not a rocket science concept, not a different concept. You know, pizza Paul, how different is that? A lobster business, how different is that? Mm -hmm. yeah? um, but the entrepreneurs drive it, they're winners, you can feel it. I look at the, and most of my business are partnerships. I do great with it, two for the price of one. Yeah, yeah you could feel when somebody's a winner. Got I think it. you can, and they're hungry. They're hungry, I could feel in my tongue. Yeah. yeah. How else do you invest your money? Do you do anything outside of real estate? Not a thing. Really? And I know that's a terrible thing. Yeah. People say spread out. Well, no, I have stocks. Okay. But the minute I find real estate, I take it out of the stock market and put it in real estate. It's probably uh, often, it's, it's not probably, it's always said that it's bad to have all your eggs in one basket. Mm. But this is a basket I know. And I've always done well with it. So I just don't like to leave my knitting into something else. Yeah. It's better. That was something that Dave Ramsey told me. Because right. I... I made a whole outline of my portfolio mm -hmm. of every investment that I had, and I showed it to him. And he looks through it, and within five minutes, he's like, you know what, I noticed you make the most amount of money in real estate, and that's what you're good at. I don't see why you're doing everything else. You Whoa, should just do it Whoa, I didn't expect that. I thought you yeah. were gonna say, and he said you should diversify. No. Every money you know my whole funny? life. Yeah, yeah. You know it's funny. It was Kevin O'Leary mm -hmm. that told me to diversify, and I did. Oh, he, he's full of shit. Come on. Let me tell you, let me tell you the story. I did the CNBC <laughs> Make It Millennial Money, the first one. Yes. And I had all of my money Money. All of my eggs were in real estate. Yeah. And he says, I think at his level, he should be working on diversifying and having multiple eggs to stand on. Yeah, and real sounds... estate and cash and index funds. And I took that to heart when that no, happened. No, you didn't. I did. But that was also a relatively good time because that was COVID in 2020. Mm -hmm. The stocks had tanked. Mm -hmm. And so I took a big chunk that I had in cash and mm. bought stocks. Uh, you some were just them... lucky more than smart. Mm. Yeah. I could, I could argue either way, because I have dollar cost average since then. Mm -hmm. Some of them have gone down since the peak, obviously. Some of them mm -hmm. done well from there. But a well good timing on that. Overall timing. good timing. Yeah, decent timing on that. Um, but then looking back, I mean, I feel better having it spread out, just knowing that, like, okay, if something were to happen to real estate, I have, you know, I like with stocks, I could see it. And, like, I see the number. Really? I you know, could see it go down, you could see it go up. You like that feeling? Yeah, I guess because I know I could press a button and it's there. I don't yeah. have to worry about it, and there's no phone calls. There's no nothing to think about or deal with, and like that's how just often a piece have of the you pie. pressed that button? And really needed the money? Never. Exactly. Yeah. You but, know what? I think yeah. you're going to grow in confidence and forget about all that stuff. I used to feel that way when I was in my late 20s. Like my God, my God, and I almost yeah. went out of business so often because I was so leveraged. But let me tell you something: you'll get over it. You'll get over yourself because you know real estate. That's nothing better. It's a such a slow, steady way to get yeah. very rich, really. Well, my thought is right now buying commercial real estate yes. because I want to lean away from residential. I think commercial is the way to go. Why? I think twofold. One, I don't want the responsibility of having uh, multiple tenants, and I think they're just, beautiful. They pay the rent. I love tenants. It's it's the management aspect, and even though with, even with it? a even with a property manager, I don't like having. Let's say, let's say a 10 unit building, there's 10 things that could go wrong separately, 10 toilets, 10 kitchens, 10 different individual renters. I like the idea of having one regional tenant who's paying the rent on time, triple net, takes care of the building. And I think. Then when they move out and go belly up, then what? Then you rent it to somebody else. Rent it to someone else and yeah. just suck wind for a few months, get it back on yeah. the market, pay the brokerage fees. Yeah, I think if I think if you could stomach that, I think if you have the finances, I don't see the issue with that. 
Um, but a lot of these tenants that I'm seeing are five to 10 year leases, mm -hmm. some with corporate guarantees, some with terms up to 20 years. Um, so I think I don't see much of the downside. But maybe I'm going to put a little cold water on that. Please, as yeah. a, you know, Of course, do what you, what you do. Yeah. Don't get involved in commercial. I'll tell you why. My experience is I have a lot of residential buildings mm -hmm. where very often the first and second floor are commercial rents. A lot of them are prime blocks that should rent easily. My tenants always replace themselves. One tenant after another, the rent goes up, the rent goes up, the rent goes up. My commercial tenants, something always goes wrong. They'll be there four years, boom, they're out of business. You got the guarantee, the parent company's out of business. Yeah. It's not as sweet as you're positioning it. There's something nice about complaining tenants who are paying their rent every, every yeah. month. Yeah. They leave, there's always another tenant to fill the spot. Not the case with commercial, I don't find. And what do you find about the stigma right now around landlords? I feel like we are moving in a direction where landlords are villainized and seen as taking advantage of a, of a situation with tenants who maybe can't afford to buy a place and the landlord is profiting from it. How do you feel about that? It's true. What do you think landlords are doing? They're trying to make money on their money by using real estate and tenants to pay their mortgage. Right. That's the way it is. It's always been that way. I don't know what else yeah. to say. <laughs> but I feel like when I first started, and this was like not that long, I mean it was really 12 years ago is when I first bought my place, um, mm -hmm. that it felt different that, that being a landlord was something that like you could work towards and work up to and mm. it was you know an accomplishment, whereas now it seems like the, the stigma has changed uh, from something that was maybe celebrated in the past to now, uh, this is bad, this shouldn't be happening mm -hmm. with uh, rent control and with other measures being put in place to really cap that. Like California mm -hmm. is a perfect example that I've not been able to raise the rent on the properties in California for three years. Because of rent control. Because of rent control. Mm -hmm. And they blocked it from COVID and they kept extending, extending, extending. Same with New York. Same yeah. with many of the cities. Right. Um, and it it's difficult, I think, to operate. And I've been in a position where it doesn't matter. And mm -hmm. usually for me, I don't raise the rent anyway. You don't. Uh, you need a managing uh, agent. Probably. I'll take my, it over. Listen, my philosophy <laughs> has always been I just want a person who takes care of it, pays on time, is respectful, nice, easy to work with. And if I make less money because of that, I don't really care as long as they pay on time and they're a good tenant and they stay long term. Well, that's honorable, uh, but I don't find my properties that I have work that way. I find the uh, gas goes up, it needs a new roof, scaffolding has got to come down, yeah. uh, the lobby has got to be refurbished, I need a new boiler. And unless you're raising the rents, you can't afford any of that. If you have a steady rent roll and higher and higher cost, you can't possibly afford to have a profitable building. Yeah. And you can't put a second mortgage on it two or three years later to get cash out to invest in on the property. Uh, I don't get it. Yeah. I think I've just been in a unique position where yeah. I bought these low, the cost is low, property taxes are low. And you've been absorbing low. the loss quietly in a way, uh, the it, potential it, the gain. Yeah, yeah the mm -hmm. difference I, I have been. Mm -hmm. uh, but for my peace of mind, it's kind of like that's the cost of just easy. So mm -hmm. I think I've paid for it in that sense. But uh, back to the Los Angeles example, mm -hmm. um, you know, I've been in a position where that's not affected me. But for so many people I know, if, if their expenses are going up, but they can't raise the rents. And I'm worried about that extending throughout mm -hmm. the rest of the United States. You're right about cities. that. Yeah. Because you know what, about three out of four uh, landlords own one individual property, yeah. a, a double family property or a house that they rent out. I think the, back to your earlier question, yeah. I think the image of the landlords, they own these conglomerates, but that's not your average landlord in the United States, it's a little guy. Right. And uh, those people are hurting right now for the same reason you can afford to take this potential gain as a loss yeah. which is really what you're doing, um, these people can't afford it and they lose their property. No, I'm concerned about that. You know, what you're really asking is whether the image of the landlord has changed. Correct. And indeed it has. But I'm going to give you the perspective of someone who started in the 70s. Yeah. If you said the word landlord to anyone in New York, people would replace it with slumlord. Hmm. The image of the landlord was they were a slumlord and generally they were. Uh, so it's improved tremendously, but has the shine come off it a little bit? Of course, when people are being gouged for rent, yeah. too much rent. Uh, of course, why wouldn't you feel that way? I don't know what else to say. I feel like I ought to apologize for being a landlord, but I love being a landlord. I love my tenants, yeah. I take care of them, and I love raising the rents. Yeah. What would you say your worst investment has been? To date? You, yeah. um, hmm. 
my, I, I'm, I don't even think I have an answer, but I could, what's come to mind, my worst mistake I made in sure. investment, which was I cowered it out uh, when I was 29, buying my first studio mm. in Greenwich Village. I just didn't have the courage. I was afraid. Yeah. And I backed out of the deal, and that was the worst mistake I ever made. The best, best investment I ever made was four years later when I caught up with the market and bought a studio. The same studio I could have bought half yeah. price, only well, close to half price four years earlier. I got four years later. That's how long it took me to catch up to yeah. the real estate market here. Uh, but what that did, it provided me a ticket into investment. I traded that for a one bedroom, traded the one bedroom for a two bedroom, traded two bedroom for a three. I went right up the yeah. ladder over the years. I could have never done that if I hadn't gotten in the game. Yeah. The most important investment is getting in the game. Yeah. How many properties do you currently own? Uh, uh, units or buildings? Let's go with units. Uh, not that many. Okay. Less than you'd think, probably maybe 150 units, old and little building. No, sure. maybe more than that. Is now. that around the United States? Uh, only in the United States, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what are some of your biggest expenses? Oh, in living, in yeah. life? Oh, I have a few. I love homes, I have four, and I love to gut renovate them, spend a ton of money. It's always expensive, but they're never empty. All my friends and family use them every night of the week, wherever they are. Yeah. So that gives me great satisfaction. Uh, facelifts, I'm vain. I've had three. That costs a lot of money to look good. Mm -hmm. uh, fashion clothing that I wear on Shark Tank. I don't give a darn about clothing, but the fact of the matter is I have to look good and I never buy anything not off a runway, so I look smashing. Yeah. And I, I guess those are my three big expenses. Cool. Yeah. Well, it's definitely not first class plane tickets. No, that, no, no, I was very surprised. You said you flew economy, or you fly economy. Have you checked out the difference in price? How do you justify a first class ticket? It, well, points, credit card points could justify uh, it. I know, but um, I wouldn't spend my points that way. Or last minute tickets. There was one I did fly first class to Florida because mm. the difference, I booked last minute, the difference between the economy and first class, I think was like $200. That's worth so it. I Maybe I'd spring for $200. Okay. But just to Florida, it's a short flight. No. Was oh, it from hours? here it is. Yeah. This was from Las Vegas. Wow, it was what a, a deal. Five hour flight. So wow, I booked what a it, deal. And it, was, it was incredible. Two hundred dollars? You $200 probably difference. laughed your way all the way over, right? Yeah. Even last minute from Vegas to New York, I think it was three hundred dollars for the econ basic economy yeah. or six hundred and fifty for the first class. Oh, I can see that. And it was a that. last minute deal. Now I flew the economy. We saved the money. But uh, I asked Alex, I'm like, dude, do you want to you know, maybe no. It's not worth it. Same well, I don't do last minute, so okay. I don't know. I don't appreciate those differences. But Emily does all my flight arrangements. Okay. Okay. And I only have one standing order. Always direct. Always coach. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't care about like I know I'm saving money by flying coach. I just like it. And you meet the nicest people. It's so much fun to sit next to someone. I get the reaction every time they go. Are you Barbara from yeah. Shark Tank? What are you doing here? You know, it, it brings out the best in people. Yeah. It really does. That's incredible. Yeah. Well, the real reason I came all the way here is because I have an idea that I want to pitch to you. Uh -oh, and I think, here we go. I think you're going to invest in it. I bet not. I think you will. I think I could change your mind. I'd invest in you, but I got to hear this well, business. Well, this idea is, is incredible. I'm sure. And Alex and I came up with it the other night. Well, he looks like a strange guy, you know. What do you think? He's going to come up with something good? <laughs> but this idea is, <laughs> gee, well, I think I uh, I came up with the idea. Yeah, no, I had nothing to do with And then Alex had nothing to do with the idea, <laughs> but we created this the other night, and I think it's a genius idea, okay? All right, so I'm editing this right now. If you guys want to see the full pitch, it's uh, at the pinned comment here, so go and check that out. Also, make sure to subscribe if you haven't done that already. And finally, if you guys want a free stock, it's worth all the way up to $1,000 with their sponsor, public.com, down below in the description with the code GRAM. Enjoy. Thank you so much, and until next time.